Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Breeze, Breezeway Productions' The Breeze. We bring the latest in independent films and film festival news, and we have a wonderful team here today to talk about the upcoming film Jurassic Punk with uh, the subject uh, Scott here, and, uh, well, the director, Scott Lieberick, and um, uh, the the main subject, uh, Steve Williams. How are you guys? Good, I'll show you. I'm good. I'm good. I just uh, just fumbled the bag a little bit there on the intro, but that's that's all right. Uh, mm-hmm. happens every once in a while. So I guess the first thing that I'll say is uh, tell me a little bit about Jurassic Punk. Uh, well, I can tell you that I started uh, filming because I wanted to make a movie about the digital revolution back in uh, 19, well, from 1988 to 1993. So I had always imagined uh, wanting to tell a story about what happened at that time and have an ensemble cast of people. I worked at ILM in from 1994 to 2000, so I got to meet a lot of people like Steve. So I always knew that was a special time and that everything changed after Jurassic Park. And I wanted to tell that story in a documentary because there I was hearing so many stories that no one publicly really knew. And I was like, man, someday it'll be so great to get these stories out there because people are going to be fascinated. And then uh, so I started shooting and I was going to make it just a film with all the everybody kind of having an equal voice. Steve being probably one of the most charismatic of the of the bunch, of course. But then um, as I went, as I kept making the film, it started to feel more like I wanted to have kind of a singular uh, character that the audience could follow and hear their story. Steve's story was probably one of the most incredible ones. Um, And also Steve was was courageous enough to give me complete access to him to film whenever and wherever and however I wanted. And he really did not uh, hold back in terms of the things he wanted to say or do. We had been friends for several years, so it was easy for him to trust me, I think. <laughs> but he but he definitely, like, we, we, we just kept shooting and it started to feel like uh, something where uh, it was, you know, it, 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 it was a collaboration in a lot of ways. Nice. Uh, I did enjoy the trailer. I checked it out. And uh, a part of that trailer, you said, uh, Steve, that you weren't very much into politics. You were kind of just like a let it rip type person and that you didn't play that game. I wanted to see if you can elaborate on that with the environment, the way that it was and how you handled yourself in the business. This is that I, I, when I came in ILM, it was like a candy store. I mean, it was all like a research laboratory. It was so wonderful. They had the money to throw. Scott Ross was the guy who was the GM of the company that threw us these machines. If we needed them, he'd get us the machines, you know, and he was great. He was integral at that time. So um, there was there was definitely a hierarchy there, which I'd never ever been used to. I, coming from Canada, I'm used to the class system. And that's the reason I left Canada, because when I started postulating these ideas about digital humans and digital creatures 40 years ago, for over 40 years ago, writing about it, everyone in Canada thought I was nuts. So you know, ILMs, uh, we, you know, you're really good with software, you know, and this is a research lab and uh, we've got, you know, the thing to, to sort of fund you to do it with Mark to pay. But the one thing I didn't know of what was, was sort of a hierarchy of Illuminati that were there. And I thought, this is odd. They don't know, for one thing that they're saying that everything that we're saying, you know, they're saying it's not possible until we visually had to prove it. So then, uh, after they start getting the awards for your work, when they told you not to bother trying, I thought this is really weird political game going on here, man. And a lot of people got that. And I'm not won't mention the names because it's fairly obvious. The guys with the nice suits and the guys with the nice cars and I, me smelling like motor oil and having a ripped shirt every day because I was a very sort of blue collar manual guy that happened to know the higher levels of math and data, which is like a, a, a freaky conundrum. The last thing I wanted to do was belong to these little clubs because I always felt that all the all the changes of the convention and standard came from the trenches, not from some Ponzi meeting at some ex- expensive restaurant where people are patting each other on the back, telling them how great they were. You know, this was very much a grassroots laboratory environment, and that's where I only trusted the trenches. So that's why I never fit in. I never fit into that thing, and, yeah, and I, I never I really really tried, but. Where I re- really got, I guess I've been out of shape is when I was criticized and beaten up, you know, and literally being told by guys like Mirren, don't bother trying to build the Rex. There's not going to be any dinosaurs in Jurassic Park, no digital dinosaurs. And I went, what? Here, this coming from a guy who's never touched a keyboard ever, right? But and so, but I, I tried very, I, I didn't, I never set out to hurt anybody ever. 
in these circumstances. I, you know, I was just following my instinct, you know, always being enamored with how things work, you know, and uh, data just being sort of uh, one of them. And so in terms of saying I wasn't good at politics, I just I, I wasn't. I, it, it was not my prime focus to climb a ladder and get the, the title of visual effects super. I didn't want that. You know, I, I thought, you know, I came in as an animator when I joined ILM in 88 and I left as an animator, you know, in 97 when Jim Morris fired me, you know, so. Well, you know. I think that your work is uh, highly regarded by those that are the audiences worldwide as their memorable, you know, uh, machines that were used, like the T-Rex, as you said, also the abyss, like with the, the, the water funnel that was out, which you see in the trailer. Also, you could see like Terminator 2 and you have Robert Patrick involved in this film as well, who's talking about his work. And then you show some behind the scenes work with that. I think that all of that is is pretty amazing. And I personally, whenever I see films, I like the things that are practical versus the things that are done by computer. And the biggest thing that I can say that really uh, strikes a tone with me is uh, Jackson's Lord of the Rings, the original trilogy versus when The Hobbit came out and the original yeah three are um, miles better than uh, than what comes out afterwards with The Hobbit. But I, and that's a discussion that will go on for another day. But <laughs> Jura but Jurassic yeah. Punk is coming out and that it'll be showcasing a lot of your work. So do you have a, a particular person that you have involved that was your favorite interview that came to the table that 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 spoke about his work that had great stories? What can people look forward to for the interviews that are involved in Jurassic Punk? And that's for Steve. Oh, Scott, Scott, sorry, Scott. Go ahead. So for yeah, uh, so um, <clears throat> what you'll what you'll see in Jurassic Punk is uh, Steve's story, his personal story and and journey as an artist and as someone who really pushed the envelope back in that day. But surrounding him are all of his kind of supporters and coworkers at the time, the people who also innovated with him alongside him and and push the envelope alongside him so uh you're gonna hear not just steve's voice but all the other people who also was were working their tails off to make to get this uh new technology working in this field of film um and then on and then we'll you'll also hear from uh the old guard i would say or the the traditional uh, artists like Phil Tippett, stop motion master, who was, uh, you know, faced with this, this obvious coming wave of technology that was in a way, um, uh, you know, dangerous for him because and his business of, of doing a uh, stop motion puppet animation. Mm. And so, so it, it's, the, so what's interesting about the film and what I always wanted was a film about people and about the conflicts and personalities that can happen in productions like this and it and it and at critical moments like this in history. And so so what you're going to find is not something that that comes off like a DVD extra about how how did they make the dinosaurs? How did they make the terminator 2? It's it's not going to be a process oriented film. It's going to be about people and the people and the challenges between the people and how did they work together and what were the political struggles as well as what were the struggles with the medium. So yeah. that's that's what you'll get when you when you watch Jurassic Punk. We, we, oh, uh, Alex, yes. In answer to your question, some of my points of view about that, because Scotty did get a great variety of interviews from different guys that, you know, that we have see Mark and I were kind of the original guys there, and Doug Smythe, you know. And that was back in 88. And then later on, we brought in the Natkins and the John Schlags and the Eric Endertons, who are great engineers, right? That really helped. And Joe Letary, you know, who we got out of Metrolite in 1990, you know, to help me with Terminator. Mm -hmm. And, um, but one of the guys that I think comes off when I see the doc, which is still very difficult for me to watch because the rise is one thing, the fall was another. Um, uh, it was guys like Bill Kimberlin, who had been an editor there for 30 years kind of a quiet guy you know ilm editor vfx editor and he kind of comes off as being the sage kind of the observer of this whole thing because he had seen that he had been there since the beginning so he kind of would sit back in dailies and he was the guy that came off i felt very astute you know um in terms of his comments about you know this stuff so in terms of the sage mentality that's why I, I i felt that's where his strength was and i also felt we know for a fact, you know, that like Phil, that was the most honest interview I've ever seen him do. Right. And he, 
he was he came off so great in it and he had resided himself because he was you yeah, remember guys like Mirren and, and Tippett were very resistant to what we were doing you know they they actually got mad you know back in the early 90s you know kind of thing when when I first said I was going to build a T-Rex and I was told not to bother trying you know so yeah. I did it secretly. So, but the thing is, is in answer to your question, you're going to see these great little conflicts that happen, which are really sort of a, an overall statement about the an arc movement in itself. You can imagine when, you know, um, this idea, it's like saying the, the earth is round. You said, no, 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 no. It's flat. As a matter of fact, you're so wrong. We're going to put you on an island for the, th the, your, the 30 years of the rest of your life, Galileo. Right. So when guys like Mark and I were pushing for these ideas, because of the general equation, which is like pix pixels are like a bathtub full of color ball bearings, right? It's just a matter of time to the organized that anything visual is possible, right? And I was, f that very statement, anything visual is possible, was fought against, you know, by the Illuminati of ILM, okay? And um, who would later get the awards for it? And I considered that dimension of theft to be just absolutely terrible. And I think Scotty's kind of, without trying to like slag on this and get bitter at this guy and bitter at that guy, you know, what Scott's done in his documentary. Oh, and incidentally, Scott, he not only shot the film, edited the film, did all the sound, did all the mixing, did all the color timing, all the legal clearances. He also did the poster. Okay. One that's guy. Indie. I like that. That's, yeah. total, <laughs> that's total indie. And that's what's so neat about this because what it does just in the, the metaphor of the movie, it means is that an individual can do the whole thing themselves, oh, you know? Yeah. yeah. So that's, that's what I love. That loved about the whole thing you know i have a few more gray hairs as a result though maybe maybe it happened <laughs> i i've covered indie films for, yeah. for many years and i hear a lot of stories of everyone doing absolutely everything that they can on less yeah. than a string budget for like three days you just get call in favors for everyone you know and then you have your your child that you've made at the end and you have more love because of how much heart you put into it and you don't have like the pampered 400 million dollar tentpole mm -hmm. where you can play around with this and have you know bougie lunches and dinners and whatever you did what you had right. to do right. to make your movies and uh, i love that stuff and i hope our audiences does as well uh and uh scott lebrecht thank you so much for coming on the show steve williams as well uh in closing i wanted to talk about the future this film reflects on the past of visual effects and animation uh and i wanted to talk about your opinion about uh where things are going in the future i know that uh cameron's avatar the second one way water power water whatever it's called is is coming out as well and that is supposed to be revolutionary for uh you know technology and visual effects i wanted your thoughts on where the uh, industry is going in that regard I think because of what, what's happening in terms of the future is that, as we know, as being human beings, we're completely driven by trying to replicate ourselves synthetically. That's why we push to these new scientific revolutions in technology and film. But prior to that, black and white was a revolution and displaced uh, the Renaissance period. And the Renaissance period displaced Lumiere and then the Italian frescoes, of which displaced cave paintings okay so it's always relative these technical revolutions so where it's going where it was and where it's heading is that eventually um now we have the merge of video first person video game players right which are a bigger industry than movies so you're seeing an amalgam especially with a marvel franchise you're seeing an amalgam where there is no story anyway anymore so the story has been deviated cameron's the only guy that will maintain story with technology and as a matter of fact had Cameron not come to us with the Abyss and Terminator, Jurassic wouldn't have been done because it was his writing that I read, you know, for the Abyss and thought, how the hell are we going to do this? So I had to come up with a way to build a water creature. Then I had to come up with Terminator 2. I thought, I got I have to build a human, right? It's never been done before. I'm going to do it, you know? And then, and then had we not done that, I built the T-Rex the exact same way that I built the T-1000. Same data set, you know, the B-spline patches using alias version 2.4.1 forward kinematic system. So where they've jumped ahead now with mocap and Andy Circus and stuff that Joe Letary has done an amazing job. Like when they did King Kong in 05, that was some of the best acting of a digital creature I've ever seen. You know, it was mind blowing what they did with King Kong, just the emotion in the creature. I think that creature itself should have been up for an Oscar for best acting, right? That digital <laughs> creature, what they did Kong. And same with Andy Serkis's work as Gollum. Um, anyway, so I think what's going to happen in the future with the merge, as I was saying, with video games and the movies, you're going to see this amalgam that's happening. And eventually, you know, this whole thing about a screen and projection, eventually you'd be watching movies in your head. Sound familiar? When they yeah. tap the optical cortex 
you know, that's where we're going because we're essentially trying to recreate a reality is what we're doing. And we have these five fallible senses that we rely on right now, you know? And so, you know, this idea, you know, like you look at companies like Neuralink, <laughs> you know, with Elon Musk, don't think that, that those things are, they're not thinking about this idea about transposing visual Im imagery on the optical cortex Leverage. because every, uh, everything's on the table. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's terrifying to me. So I'm just going to stick to the old fashioned way of doing things and check out Jurassic Punk on the old school screen without no chips in my head or anything like that. But I definitely look forward to watching it in, in its entirety. And I hope our audiences does as well. Uh, where can people go to find out more about Jurassic Punk? Oh, Alex, or, let me, let me yeah. interject thing, seeing as though we're talking about everybody now terrified, especially in the artistic community, about AI displacing like Photoshop and displays. And that's the latest thing I've been reading, you know, about the artistic form where you're sitting down and actually doing the work yourself, right? But I just want people to understand AI already happened. It's called us. And all we're trying to do is cycle back to replicate the way that our neurology is put together, right? I'm, anyway. So the, <laughs> so the, so Jurassic Punk, you can go to our website, jurassicpunkmovie.com. You can also find us on Instagram, Jurassic Punk Movie. Uh, we, you can purchase the film or rent it, uh, on December 16th. You can actually pre-order it now, um, on iTunes. It's going to be also available on Vudu and Amazon prime. Uh, we're having a couple theatrical runs, uh, coming up in a couple cities, LA and New York, I think I'm being told, uh, but we don't have those times yet. Um, and then, uh, and cable stations, it's, it's get, it's really going to get out there. Nice. Awesome. Yeah. Well, uh, we're happy to talk about it. And it was a pleasure again speaking with you, Scott uh, Lebrecht and uh, Steve Williams. Uh, it's an honor to speak to you. And I'm glad uh, that we both agree on the old school visual effects just being better for film and the new school stuff. But, you know, the the guards change. But I, I'm very happy to to learn more about, you know, uh, the cinema as it is and the aspects of what goes into creating these things. So, again, thank you, gentlemen, for joining me today on The Breeze. Thanks, Alex. It's always relevant. Always relative, Alex. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great, great question, Alex. Yeah. Thank you. Thank